bow together for prayer. We thank you, Lord, because you do give and you take away. When you give, it's wonderful, and when you take away, it doesn't feel good initially. But eventually, we see that even that was good. Your promise rings true, first stated by Joseph at the end of Genesis, and then reiterated by Paul in Romans 8, that what people may mean for evil, you turn out for good. It's odd, even in the, uh, the scare of COVID, the wonderful thing about it is that if you get it and survive it, you're not going to probably get it again. So that's a good thing. We tend to be afraid of so many things and worried about life. And yet all of a sudden you just turn things around in wonderful ways. Sometimes they don't feel like we said wonderful. We, we watched our brother Demetrio go to be with the Lord and then exactly one week later, Jane Wade, Gary's mom, goes to heaven. She's with us on Saturday night. She's raising her hands and praise and having tons of fun, swimming in the pool. And then all of a sudden, they walk in, and there she is with a cup of coffee, sleeping in the arms of Jesus. What a pleasant transition. I, I do that right now. You want to take me now? That's fine. That's a great way to go. That's, that's the preferred way, Lord. But it's not preferred to us because we, we have their faces in our mind's eye and we, I see them on Saturday night and Sunday morning and I won't see them till we get to glory. But I will see them and we all will, Lord. Be with the family members who um, are going through loss of having someone throughout a lifetime next to them and now they, they disappear and go to glory. Remind them, reassure them, and for all of us, let this be an experience that draws us closer to you and motivates us to pray each day, Lord, come quickly. Send your son in the rapture. Bring us up to heaven. We are more than ready to go. Continue to be with us as we live in a tumultuous world where people continue to incite fear politically. They incite fear uh, health-wise we get just the bits and pieces, just enough to frighten us and not the whole truth behind the scenes which would comfort us because Satan and the media wants us terrified at all times. And you command us over and over again, hundreds of times, the most familiar command, don't be afraid because fear is the polar opposite of what you call for, the life of faith. So we want to live for you. We want, to, we want to demonstrate faith when it comes to our giving. As today we have an opportunity to give. We could, we could give online. We could give in the baskets in the front and the back. We could give by sending it in. We could give by bringing it in. That's like four different ways to give, and you've made it so easy for us. We pray that we will continue to honor you with our finances. Continue to be grateful for your grace. And one of the great ways we do that is by honoring you, by reaching deep and giving, knowing that as we give to you, you always give in return. So, Lord, that's the great thing. Whether we're reaching in to write the check and giving, whether we're going through a tough time, whatever we're doing that seems to be difficult or a bit sacrificial, we do it with joy because we always know it benefits us in the end. It always turns out wonderful because we're the king's kids and it can't help but be wonderful for us. So we're going to honor you and love you in this time, Lord, as we lift our hearts and our needs and our desires and our passions to you. Help us to be through this worship we've experienced, through the giving in which we will engage in later, and for the time in your word, the best Christians we could possibly be. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Real quick, Jesus said, if you try to save your life, you'll lose it. 
but if you, if you lose your life, you'll find it. So let's all, wherever we're at today as we sit here, let's find the life that want, the Lord wants us to see and have this morning. We're going to be reading from Acts 21, 1, verse 1 through 26. If you have your Bibles opened, amen. When we had parted from them, we had set sail. We ran a straight course for Kos the next day to Rhodes and then to Patera. And having found a ship crossing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we came in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we kept sailing to Syria. Crossing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard, oh, set, missed my verse. When we came in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we kept sailing to Syria and landed in Tyre, for the ship was to unload its cargo. After looking up the disciples, we stayed there seven days, and they kept telling Paul, through the Spirit, not to set foot in Jerusalem. When our days there were ended, we left and started on our journey, while they all, with wives and children, escorted us until we were out of the city. After kneeling down on the beach and praying, we said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship, and they returned home again. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemus, and after greeting the brethren, we stayed there with them one day. On the next day, we left and came to Caesarea, and entering the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, we stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who were prophetesses. As we were staying there for some days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. He came to us, took Paul's belt, bound his own feet and hands, and said, This is the way the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, we all, as well as the local residents, began begging him, Do not go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, what are you doing weeping and breaking my heart? For, oh my goodness, listen to this. For I am not only to be bound and even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. <laughs> and he would not be persuaded, he fell silent remarking, the will of the Lord be done. After these days, we got ready and started on our journey to Jerusalem. Some of the disciples of Caesarea also came, taken to us one son of Cyprus, the disciple long-standing and, who, and with whom we lodged. We arrived in Jerusalem. The brethren received us gladly. The following day, Paul went with us to James, and all the elders were present. And he greeted them and began to relate one by one the things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they began glorifying God. And they said to him, you see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews who those who have believed and they are still jealous for the law. And they had been told about you that you are teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them, not to circumcise their children, nor to walk according to the customs. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear what you, that you have come. Therefore, do this as we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Take them and purify yourselves along with them. Pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads, and all will know that there is nothing to the things which they have been told about you but that you yourself also walk orderly according to the law. But concerning the Gentiles who have believed, we wrote, having decided they should abstain from meat sacrificed to idols, from the blood from them it is strangled, and from fornication. Paul took the men, the next day purifying himself along with them, 
went into the temple giving notice of the completion of the days of purification until the sacrifice was offered for each of them. Amen. Pastor. The children's ministry is in need of two teachers. We had two, but they stepped down for a while. So if you would like to assist with the kids, the wonderful thing about now is that we have two services. So therefore, if you want to teach on um, Sunday morning, you could come on Saturday night. You won't miss anything. Isn't that wonderful? So be sure to let D or me know. See, that's an easy way to remember it. D or me. We'd love to have either two men or two women assisting with the little ones. And then on Saturday, December the 5th at 10 a.m., uh, Debbie Gonzalez is going to be hosting an arts and crafts show. It's going to be a sale in the fellowship hall. It's a way to kind of help them financially. They've been going through some really tough times as a family. And then they're also going to give a percentage of that back to the church to honor God. So that'll be December the 5th from 10 to 4. Keep that in mind. Well, let's bow together once again for a time of prayer. We love you, Lord. We thank you for the fact that uh, you continue to show your love to us. You know, the older I get, Lord, as I get up in the morning and I get in the car and start praying, most of my prayer is just thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm just overwhelmed by how much you love me and, and my favorite Three words are the same words I share with my beautiful bride. I love you. I love you. I hope I just continue to grow that way. And never become unsatisfied, dissatisfied, or ungrateful. Because when we look at our lives, we realize that you're so good to us. Even in the times that appear kind of dark. That's how it's going to be for Paul today. It's, uh, it's a time for him, as the, as the title of the message suggests, to, to stand strong. And, and that's going to be the theme that we're going to send throughout this passage today because your spirit inspired Luke to send that theme when he wrote these words thousands of years ago. So help us to you know, put iron in our souls, to take the stands, whatever they may be that you call us to take to do it with as much grace as possible, but equaled with firmness and boldness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Former Lakers player and head coach Byron Scott said he once found an 18-year-old boy shooting baskets in a dark gym. I heard the ball bouncing. There were absolutely no lights on. Practice was at 11. It was about 9 o'clock. I go out to the court and look, and, and there's Kobe Bryant, 18-year-old, shooting in the dark. I stood there for about a minute and then said to myself, this kid is going to be great. The elite performance coach, uh, Tom Grover, who's worked with men like Michael Jordan, Dwayne Wade, and Kobe Bryant, put an even blunter tip on the message as he writes these words. People are always asking me about the secrets and tricks that I use to get results. I'm sorry if this disappoints you. There are no secrets. There are no tricks. Ask yourself, where are you at and where do you want to be in life? Ask yourself, what are you willing to do to get there? Then make a plan and achieve it. There are no shortcuts. I don't want to hear about workouts you could do in five minutes or 20 minutes a week. That's total nonsense. Real champions get into the zone. They shut out everything else and they control the uncontrollable. Now, based on that definition, we'd have to call the Apostle Paul a true champion. Because this man again and again throughout the book of Acts has stepped into the zone and controlled the uncontrollable. You recall back in chapter 14, he steps into the city of Lystra. What do they do after he's finished preaching? They stone him and leave him for dead. That would make most people quit the ministry. You think so? 
What did he do? Sit there and sing, nobody knows the trouble I'm in. No, he doesn't sing that. He gets up bruised and bloodied and beaten up, and he preaches again. And the next day, he walks in that broken state 40 miles to the next town to preach another sermon. Acts chapter 16 has a glorious ministry in the city of Philippi. And then he's accused of something he did not commit. And so they beat him with rods. And they put him in stocks. And they stick him in prison. And he sings songs of praise for grace and gratitude to God. And then the Lord sends an earthquake. And they're set free. Kicked out of the town. So he goes to Thessalonica. He's there for only two weeks, and they kick him out of that town as well. So that in chapter 19, he shows up in Ephesus, and a major riot breaks out that almost takes his life. But Paul keeps shooting in the dark. He was unstoppable. That's why Rome had to cut off his head. That's the only way you could stop the Apostle Paul. He had one simple goal. To get the good news into the heart of every Jew and Gentile that he met. He sums up his basic philosophy in 1 Corinthians 9.22. I've become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. And he keeps shooting in the dark until that goal was achieved. Nowhere is that principle more clearly presented than in today's slice of scripture that Pastor Dave read for you. Now, Paul's going to make two decisions. The first decision sounds absolutely and utterly foolish to his Christian friends. The second decision opens the door to apparent disaster. Doesn't sound very successful, does it? It's like shooting in the dark. But Paul knew, even if no one else in the world knew, that God had called him and he was going to stay with his goal. In Acts 21, the apostle blocks everything out and controls the uncontrollable. And child of God, that's what the Lord's asking for you today as well. That's going to be the secret to your success in life. Don't just muddle through life, wasting your time, wasting air. You were created for a specific purpose. And until you answer this question, you're wasting your life. The question is, why did God make me? Why did he put me here in the city of Orange, here with this family, here in this church. And the way you discover the answer to that question is you take a look at your talents, your gifts, your abilities, and your passions. Those are hints from the Holy Spirit to help you see what he wants you to do. And once you discover what God has called you to do, child of God, you go for it. You do it. Don't let anyone detour you or derail you from achieving your objective. Martha Wade with the quarter blue. Ron Petrello with the Accountability Brothers discovered the reason for existence in life. They don't care what people say. They don't care what people do. They give their whole life to the passion of a ministry and an outreach that's going to impact people for the glory of God. And they will tell you from personal experience, it's not always easy. We might even say it's not often easy. But you have to control the uncontrollable. And sometimes it will be like Kobe Bryant shooting in the dark. Some people may misunderstand you. Others will purposely put you down. That's okay. It's going to happen today to Paul. Shut him out and keep shooting. Say that with me. Shut him out and keep shooting. And God will grant you success. And that brings us to the first thought as we step in today's text. The bold premonition. What's the premonition Paul's friends give him? Don't enter Jerusalem. 
But before we look at that premonition, we will see it's preceded by a little trip that Paul takes. So that brings us to letter A in your outline, the journey presented. Take a look at verse 1. When we parted from them and had set sail, stop there. The word parted in the Greek means to rip away emotionally. It speaks of a sad goodbye, the emotional trauma of leaving people that you love. 20 years ago, both of my daughters who had been with me their entire life left me. One daughter went to one side of the United States to go to school at New York, and the opposite daughter, as far as you can go, and still be the United States of America in Hawaii, <laughs> thousands of miles from each other. And they both left within the course of seven days. I remember the day for each of them, saying goodbye to them, giving them a special gift, hugging them, getting in the car, driving away, and bawling like a baby. Because you see, I knew in my heart that was going to change my relationship with them forever. I would seldom see them again. It's exactly what Paul experienced. Scoop back to last week's passage, chapter 20, 37 to 38. They began to weep aloud and embrace Paul and repeatedly kissed him, grieving especially over the word which he'd spoken. They would not see his face again as they accompanied him to the ship. I see my daughters, but seldom every few years for a few days, I get to see their face. It's hard. That's how Paul felt as he was boarding the boat, leaving some of his favorite people in the world, going to the next towns. Verse 1 said they ran a straight course to Kos, next day to Rhodes, there to Patara. These were uh, three separate cities, each within a day's journey. Kos was the home of Hippocrates, who was the father of modern medicine. And then Rhodes was once home to the incredible Colossus. You say, Colossus? You mean Magic Mountain? Are we talking about that roller coaster? No, no, no. We're, we're talking about this amazing bronze statue that was shaped like a man. He had one foot on one side of the harbor and one foot on the opposite side, and ships would go between his legs. It's incredible. Paul Never saw it. Because by the time Paul arrives in the town, an earthquake happened, broke one of the legs, and all the king's horses and all the king's men could not put Colossus together again. And having found a ship, verse 2, crossing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. And we came inside of Cyprus, leaving it on the left. We kept sailing to Syria, landing at Tyre, for the ship was going to unload its cargo. Tyre was a place known for its commerce. Uh, King David traded with Hiram, who was the monarch of Tyre. Both in the Old Testament, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, Alexander the Great of Greece, combined together to make that town less special. They, they took over the place. And so by the time Paul shows up, it has reached its heyday. It's not quite as popular as it once was due to those major attacks. And verse 3 said, there the ship would unload its cargo. So Paul leaves a tiny ship, a tire, boards a much bigger boat en route to Jerusalem. And so we move now from the journey presented to letter B, the jeopardy predicted. Now this jeopardy predicted is the premonition that is given to Paul by people who are telling him, don't go to Jerusalem. Verse 4. And looking up the disciples, we stayed there seven days, and they kept telling Paul through the Spirit, don't set foot in Jerusalem. Somehow the Holy Spirit ministers to the leaders of the folks in the church and says we're unified in this thought. The worst thing you could do is to go to the holy city. 
Because if you go there, you're going to go through tough times. What's Paul's response to that? Look at last week's message, chapter 20, 22, 23. Now behold, bound of the Spirit, I'm on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me except what? The Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, bonds and afflictions wait me. Bonds in Jerusalem, big deal. Tell me something I don't already know. I know what it's like to shoot in the dark. Besides, it says in chapter 20 and verse 24, this is a ministry that Jesus himself gave me. He's not backing down. We love leaders, whether they're political leaders, spiritual leaders, leaders in the area of sports, commerce, and any area who set their face like a flint towards the goal and will not be stopped by criticism or put downs, don't we? We love people who continue to push through even in spite of the threat of death. A missionary from England boarded a vessel en route to Lagos on the African coast. He was going to minister to people for Christ in a town that was infected with a disease that was infinitely more deadly than COVID-19. And so when he got aboard the boat, someone shouted from the dock, if you go to that town, you will die. And the missionary shouted back, I died before I left London. I love that. That's the Apostle Paul. That's where God wants your heart and mine at today. Dead to our desires, alive to God's. Verse 5. When our days there were ended, we left and started out in a journey, while they all, with wives and children, escorted us until we were out of the city. After kneeling down to the beach and praying, we said farewell to one another. And so you see, neither the possibility of persecution or the pleadings of soft-hearted saints are going to prevent Paul from achieving his destination. Because once you know what God wants you to do, you go full speed ahead. Verses 6 to 7. Then we went aboard the ship. They returned home again. When we finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemus. And after greeting the brethren, we stayed with them for one day. Ptolemus was a 25-mile journey south of Tyre. Paul fellowship for 24 hours with the believers. He's off again, verse 8. On the next day, we left and came to Caesarea. This is Palestinian soil. Caesarea is the Jewish port. It's 60 miles northwest of Jerusalem, the seat of the Roman government in Palestine. And notice now in verse 8, it's home to a man called Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven. Who's the seven? Remember Acts 6? The seven chosen to disperse the food and the money amongst the widows. These were the original deacons. And Philip becomes the most famous, along with Stephen, of all the deacons in the New Testament. Because he starts to share the gospel and he discovers that God blesses what he does. And that's his gift. That's his passion. That's his way of controlling the uncontrollable. And God calls him to the city of Samaria where no Jew would ever step foot in. And he gives the gospel and revival breaks out in Samaria. And it breaks out of the other towns. And then God sweeps him up, takes him to the Gaza Strip. He leads an Ethiopian eunuch to Christ. That man takes the gospel, goes to Ethiopia. And the first church begins in Africa before it ever began in Europe, before it ever came. And so if you ever look down your nose at black people, realize they should be looking down their nose at you. <laughs> they were the first to get the gospel. All through a deacon who knew his passion for life. And he had some gifted girls. You see them in the next verse? Now this man had four virgin daughters who were prophetesses. God had supernaturally gifted these gals with a prophetic ability to offer practical insight to the lives of others. But what's interesting is even though they had the gift of prophecy, they are silent when it comes to Paul's journey. 
They say nothing about him taking a trip to Jerusalem. But there's another prophet named Agabus who does speak out. Agabus had been friends with Paul 15 years prior to this date when they were engaged in a ministry in Jerusalem. And he will speak, verses 10 and 11. As we were staying there for some days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own feet and hands, and said, this is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews of Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of of the Gentiles. So he dramatically grabs Paul's belt, not made of leather, but of folded cloth, and he uses it to tie his hands, to tie his feet, and he said, Paul, this is what's going to happen to you. They're going to tie you up. They're going to take you down. Would you like someone to give you that prophecy? Not a very hopeful future, is it? Jack was depressed when he got back from the doctor's office. His wife said, what's wrong? He said, well, the doctor said I have to take one of these white pills every day for the rest of my life. She said, well, what's wrong with that? He replied, he only gave me seven. <laughs> Paul, you may not have long to live, verse 12. When he heard this, as well as the local residents began begging him, don't go to Jerusalem. The we tells us that Luke chimed in with the concerned corral. No, no, please don't go. Please don't go. After all, Paul, you've been told twice. How many times you have to be told? The Spirit of God said, no, don't do it. Jewish proverb says, if one person calls you a donkey, pay no attention. If two people call you a donkey, check for hoof prints. If three call you a donkey, purchase a saddle. <laughs> Hee-haw! Paul, don't act like a donkey now. Come on now. We don't want you suffering like that. Look at Paul's response, verse 13. What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but even to what? Die in Jerusalem for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. Several years before the planes hit the towers on September 11th, taking down those twin towers in New York City and attacking the Pentagon, Americans already had become vulnerable to the threat of terrorism. It was in April of 1995 when the Marah building and uh, the heartland of America, Oklahoma City, experienced its great bombing. More than 160 people died, 400 were badly injured. They discovered 12 children were killed in a daycare in that building. We really thought we were 20 years behind the big cities in crime and mayhem, said Oklahoma City Attorney John Casey, himself injured in the blast. Now we know that we're in the same country as New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles. One professor at the University of Washington added, we're now finding out that no one is safe anymore and people are astoundingly frightened. And if people were frightened a few years ago by terrorist attacks, look at how that fear is amplified in the past eight months with the virus. Everywhere we turn in America and in the world today, people are, are fueled by just one form of fuel in their gas tank. It's not peace, it's not hope, it's not happiness. It's 86 octane of fear, 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 fear. And I said before, I'll say again, please, find some other way of discovering what's happening in the world. Don't listen to the media. The word is manipulated. It's driven to make you panic-stricken. God doesn't want us living that way. God told through Paul to young Timothy in 2 Timothy, God has given you a spirit 
of a power of love and a sound mind, not the spirit of fear. If you're living in fear, you are out of the will of God. You cannot be in fear and exercise faith at the same time. You've got to choose one or the other. I'm so glad that those of you who are here today have chosen faith. Give yourself a hand. Good job. Yes. We're trusting the Lord. We're going to look to him. He'll make it all right. And that's what Paul is saying. He's all alone, but he feels like he's shooting baskets in the dark because everywhere he turns, every city he goes to, people say, don't go to Jerusalem. You're going to die. You're going to die. How often have we been told that today by the media? You're going to die. You're going to die. And what's Paul's response? Boo-hoo. You're breaking my heart. I don't mind being bound in that big city for Jesus. In fact, I'm willing to die if necessary. You know why? Because he's riding God's rail. And he's not going to be derailed. You remember Corey Ten Boom, the great saint who, along with their family, housed the Jews in their home, knowing it could take their lives and cost their lives, but they did it because they stood strong. They're shooting in the dark against, again, like we're dealing with a wicked, evil government led by a man who thought he knew everything and made unilateral decisions like some of our men are today. We won't listen to that. We know what's right. It's wrong to give up the Jewish people. So they created a hiding place. And the neat thing is they never found those Jews. They never found them. But they did take Corey and her dad and her sister to Ravensbrück concentration camp. And the father and sister died there. And Corey should have been executed as well, but through a a miraculous, sovereign, clerical error. She was released to tell the world of what God taught her during those years. Here's one of Corey's favorite statements. When the train goes through the tunnel, here she is, and your world gets dark, do you jump out? No! You sit still and you trust the engineer to get you through. Don't listen to the world that tells you to jump. You stay with it. You trust the engineer who is God. He will get you through. God calls you to a mission. God calls you to a ministry. God calls you to an outreach. Like Corey, like Paul, a time's going to come. You must take a stand you must do what is right. Others may misunderstand you like they're misunderstanding Paul, but you press on, you ride God's rail, and you reach your destination. Watch what happens in verse 14. Since he would not be persuaded, we fell silent, remarking, well, the will of the Lord be done. <laughs> I like that. Can't stop him, may as well support him. Okay, Paul, if you're going to go to Jerusalem, if you're going to be bound in Jerusalem, if you're going to die in Jerusalem, we're with you in Jerusalem. That's the way it should be. Jump on board the train, choo-choo, down the track, go all the way. So the bold premonition, don't enter Jerusalem, leads to the second point in your outline, the brother's proclamation. If you're going to enter Jerusalem, do encourage the Jews. Don't enter Jerusalem, but if you're going to go, do encourage the Jews. And it all begins with the visit. Verses 15 to 20. After these days we got ready and started on our way up to Jerusalem. And but since I could not see because of the brightness of that light. Whoa, that was the next chapter. That's they stuck together. <laughs> Some of the disciples from Caesarea also came with us, taking us to Manes, son of Cyprus, a disciple of long standing with whom we were to lodge. Now, after we arrived in Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went with us to James and all the other elders were present. After he greeted them, he began to relate one by one the things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. Now, when they heard it, 
they began glorifying God. Said to Paul, you see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed and they're zealous for the Lord. Do you know that when Paul was out evangelizing Gentiles in every town in Judea and every town he could reach in Europe, in the Mideast, God was doing a work back in Jerusalem amongst the Jews. This happened in 57 AD. And scholars tell us in the year 57 AD, guess how many Jewish people were trusting Jesus as their Messiah? 50,000. This was the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit on Israel in the history of that nation. Now, shortly after that, things began to change. And the gospel went almost exclusively to the Gentiles. And many Jews have resisted. But at this unique period in time, they were responsive. And so when Paul comes back to the city for this visit, they say, you can't believe how many people are accepting the Messiah. So it's all good news, but then it becomes bad news. Just like we saw, there's going to be some trouble. Paul knew it was coming. The visit, sadly, leads to, oh, the vicious rumors. The vicious rumors. Take a look in your Bible, verses 20 to 22. Well, you saw verse 20. How many thousands there are amongst the Jews? They've all believed. And verse 21, they've been told about you. You're teaching the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses. Really? You're telling those Jews among the Gentiles, don't you circumcise their children. Don't walk according to the customs. What then is going to be done? They're certainly going to hear that you've come. A question, Bible students. Did Paul ever teach Jewish people to hate Moses and not circumcise their children? I hope you say no. No. If Paul was against circumcising Jewish boys, why, in God's name, did he circumcise Timothy in Acts 16 to get him ready for the ministry? If Paul was against Jewish customs, why did he, in Acts chapter 16... Or in Acts chapter 18, take a Jewish Nazarite vow. He's trying to show the Jews, even though I have a passion for the Gentiles, I love the Jews, I'm a Jew myself. But people weren't buying it. You know why? Because of verse 21. One little word tells us it. And they have been, oh, there it is, circle that, underlie it, star it. It's the word told. They've been told about you. It's the Greek word katakeo. Say that with me. Katakeo. Try it again. You're kind of quiet. Katakeo. It's fun to say those words. Have some fun. Okay. Do you know what word we get from katakeo? Catechism. You know what catechism is? Teaching by repetition. So they told the people again and again and again and again and again and again and again. Hey, Paul hates the Hebrews. He loves just the Gentiles. Paul hates the Hebrews. He loves just the Gentiles. And they spread this gossip amongst the Jews all throughout Jerusalem. So when Paul shows up, there's going to be some trouble. It's not true. In every town Paul went to, he first went to the synagogue. To the Jews first, that's what it says in Romans chapter 1. And then also to the Gentiles. But this was a scuttlebutt on the gossip Jewish train. Hey, let me ask you a question. Ready to raise your hand? Have you ever been the topic of someone's gossip? Yes, but the second question is, ever gossiped about someone? The rest of you are liars, I'm sorry. <laughs> We've all done it. We've all spoken badly about people. And God doesn't want us to do that. He, he, someone said the only thing that you should do behind a person's back is pat it. 
We speak to people face to face, don't we? But these people were involved in a gossip train and they were destroying the character of Paul and you're going to see next week it leads to a lot of pain and confusion and a real mess for him. Some folks make monkeys of themselves by carrying tails. Yeah. Legalistic chimpanzees were choosing to misinterpret Paul's words, Paul's motives. Ever have someone misinterpret your motives? You do something right, you think something right, you are right, but you're treated as if you were wrong. Once, a pastor writes, I was riding in a car with a rigid legalist on our way to a speaking engagement. We came across the crest of a hill and there spread out before us was a magnificent vista of mountains and sky. I was so taken back by what I saw, I said out loud, oh God, that is beautiful. My uptight legalistic partner said, I wish you wouldn't talk like that around me. He didn't know I wasn't talking to him. I was talking to God. He assumed I was using profanity. You want to make your life miserable? You want to develop more enemies and less friends? You want people not to invite you over to the house ever? Here's how you do it. Live your life making assumptions. Believe everything everyone tells you. Believe everything the media tells you. Don't assume anything. Don't assume what I say. Go in your Bibles and check it out. That's why the Bereans were considered the noble people because they checked out what Paul had to say. Do your research. Find the truth. And Jesus said the truth will set you free. Don't live a life of assumptions. Never forget the uh, movie of the 70s when Walter Matthau was still alive. Remember, he was stuck with that baseball team, the Bad News Bears. You never forget that, do you? He brings out the chalkboard. He writes the word assume, A-S-S-U and me. He said, every time you assume, you make an ass out of you and me. That's 110% accurate. And these people are making fools out of themselves and trying to make a fool out of Paul. Completely misinterpreting his words. Like the two spinster ladies from the East Coast who came to the West Coast for a vacation. And they traveled from town to town, from up in San Francisco down to San Diego. And they decided, hey, let's visit that beautiful, picturesque town. And they called it La Jolla. <laughs> because it looks like La Jolla, doesn't it? But everywhere they went, they heard people calling it La Jolla, La Jolla. And so they stopped at an ice cream shop and they said, you know, we're kind of confused. We're not sure from the wrong town or not. Where are we? And could you pronounce it very slowly? He said, sure, Dairy Queen. <laughs> he missed the point and so did these critical Jews. And so Paul, to try to overcome the vicious rumors, letter C takes the vow, the vow. Verses 22 to 24. What then's to be done? They're certainly going to hear that you've come. Therefore, do this that we tell you. We have found four men who are under a vow. Take those men, purify yourself along with them, pay their expenses so that they may share their heads, and we all will know there's nothing to the things which they have been told about you, that you yourselves also with orderly keep the law. Now, this is the Nazarite vow. It's mentioned in chapter 6 of Numbers. Paul already took it months before, years before, in chapter 18. You cut off the hair, symbolizing the strength of your life. You offer it to God in the Jewish temple. And then you go through a process of purification because Paul was considered unclean. We have some people in our church who've already gone through this. We have people going through it right now. They've either been tested positive for COVID or they've been with someone who has tested positive for COVID. So you go through a process of purification. 
You may have absolutely no symptoms. You may be asymptomatic. You may have symptoms, whatever it is. You do your best to stay away from people until you are considered pure and ready to arrive in public again. That's exactly what Paul was going through in a custom sense with the Jews. He had been in Gentile territory, dirty territory, as far as they were concerned, COVID territory. So he has to clean himself out. And that costs money. So Paul, you pay for yourself, and you pay for these men, and you pick up the tab for everyone, and in doing so, you're showing the Jews that you really do care for Jewish people, and you're not out to destroy them. Verse 25. Concerning the Gentiles who believe that you talked about, we wrote, having decided that they should abstain from meat, sacrificed to idols, and from blood, and from that which is strangled, and from fornication. It's the same stuff we talked about way back in chapter 15 of the book of Acts at the great Jerusalem council when they were asking, what do we do to bring the Gentiles into a Jewish church with a Jewish Messiah? Do we insist they get circumcised? Do we push all the Hebraic customs on them? And they decided wisely for us today because the decision 2,000 years ago impacts us today in 2020. No, you don't have to do all that stuff. But we ask that you do three things so as you don't offend the Jews. Number one, since God said the blood is, it, the life of the human being is the blood and it is a sacrilege to drink the blood, make sure that the Gentiles drain all the blood from their milk, meat before they drink it. Secondly, idolatry got the Jews into a lot of trouble in the Old Testament. And so don't eat any meat ever offered to an idol. And the third is kind of common sense. Don't take your pants off and jump in bed with someone who's not your partner. Okay? That's what it means, if I could translate, to abstain from fornication. Those are the three things. That's what we're all asking them to do. That's it. So they're saying, Paul, we want you to encourage the Jews. We want you to pay some money. We want you to cut your hair. We want you to go through a process of purification. We want you to be sensitive to their needs. What did Paul say? I'm a missionary. I don't have to be sensitive. No one tells me what to do. I'm a maverick. I'm a rebel. Was that Paul's response? No. He will bend over backwards and do whatever he needs to do so as not to hurt the cause of the gospel. He wants them to know that he supports them. Verse 26. Paul took the men. The next day he purified himself along with them. They went into the temple giving notice of the completion of the days of purification until the sacrifice was offered for each one of them. I mean, why did Paul come to Jerusalem in the first place? He had nothing else to do? What's he been doing for years? He's been collecting money, hasn't he? He's been going from Gentile church to Gentile church to Gentile church and saying the brothers are going through a time of famine, and they are right now in 57 AD in Jerusalem. And so they need our support. And instead of breaking Jews and Gentiles and hating each other, I want to be a unifier. I want to bring people together. So this is a token of their appreciation for you as Jewish, giving us as Gentiles the gospel. They're giving money back to say thank you. Because all, Paul was all about, all about making a bonding and not a barrier between them. Isn't that a great motive? Could you think of a better motive? And it all goes south. It all goes south. It all turns out, at least apparently, wrong for Paul. His good motive, motives were treated as if they were bad. His wise decision leads to wicked confusion. And Paul, as we'll see next week, ends up misinterpreted, misunderstood, and mistreated. That brings us today to where the rubber meets the road, and that is the closing comment. Say it aloud with me. 
the outcome may not be an indication of the accuracy of your decision. The outcome may not be an indication of the accuracy of your decision. If that is confusing at all to you, let me frame it in a simpler way. Ready? Just because things didn't turn out right doesn't mean that you are not right. And entering Jerusalem and encouraging the Jews, Paul had the right motives. He'll be treated as if he was wrong. And Paul said, if I had a chance to do it again, I'd do the exact same thing. Just graduated from seminary, entering my first church full time. And I stepped into a congregation with an elder who just didn't like me at all. He happened to be the most influential person in the entire town and in the church. I would learn that years later. I don't know why he didn't like me. Maybe I was too young, I was too bold, I was too brash. But I discovered it right off the bat that nine times out of ten when I would preach a sermon, he would come to critique me and tell me, you shouldn't have said that, you're going to offend so-and-so in the town. You're not. This went on for years. And it seems like in every single meeting we had as leaders, he was always there to kind of checkmate me, to second guess me, and to take what I say and twist it. Now, I was patient for five and a half years, and I think that for me, that's a long time. And finally, people were telling me that I respected, how long are you going to take this, Pastor? This man is not being driven by God. He has his own desires, his own intentions, and he's hampering the progress of the church. We've got to do something about it. So even though we had elders in that church, they were basically puppets because it was not an elder-run church. It was a congregational-run church, which meant the congregation made the decisions on every single thing that happened. So following protocol, first I went to him and said, you know, brother, I love you, but it seems like we cross swords a lot and you know, I feel like the progress is, has been hampered for the church. Would, would you be willing to step down from leadership? He goes, not on your life. Yeah, I asked him to step down. And so I go, okay, I'm going to have a congregational meeting. And I announced the congregational meeting two weeks ahead of time. And you know that during those two weeks, I got phone calls and visits and people taking me out to lunch. Every time someone says they want to take me out to lunch, I get scared because usually and historically it hasn't worked out good for me. Just tell me over the phone what you want to tell me. It's like Bob Windhauser. He's not here today, but you know, every time I say, Bob, would you come see my office? <laughs> I can't hear. <laughs> He's scared to death to come in to see me. Although I've never heard him. So the message was the same. Don't do it. The same thing they told Paul. Don't do it, Pastor. This guy's the powerhouse of the town. He's the powerhouse of the church. Do you know how much he was the powerhouse? My daughter, Carla, age three, we were walking out of church one Sunday after we'd been there for three years. I was locking the glass door, and she said, hey, Daddy, I know who owns this church. I said, who, sweetheart? And she gave the man's name. And I thought, even a three-year-old could see that? So everyone's telling me, don't do it. It's going to ruin the church. It's going to ruin your ministry. The repercussions will be bad. And then others said, Pastor, you've got to do what's right before God. So I fasted and asked for wisdom, and I prayed. And we had the congregational meeting. And everything went amazingly smooth. So it seemed. And then they started meeting behind my back. And then before I knew it, the boat was taken and I was out. And then they put out the next pastor. Then they put out one after another until there's only eight people left and the church does not exist today. They were right. Rick, if you do this, it'll turn out wrong. 
And if I had a chance to turn back time, I wouldn't change a solitary thing. It's going to happen to you. It's going to happen to you. You're not exempt from this if you're a child of God. The time's going to come. It may happen in this church. It may happen in a Bible study. It may happen at your employment. It may happen with your parents or your brother or your sister. It's going to happen unless you are some mealy mouth amoeba. But if you're a man or woman of God, there's going to be a time you're going to have to take a stand for the truth. And you'll be misunderstood. And you'll be mistreated. You may suffer some consequences. But just because things don't turn out right don't mean you're not right. Let's bow together. People who witness the crucifixion of Christ would have been quick to conclude what a foolish waste. What's wrong with that man? I mean, five days before, they were screaming Hosanna on the city streets, ready to crown him king. Now he's crucified. What happened? What a foolish waste to a fabulous ministry. Riveted to a rugged cross, forsaken by family, forsaken by followers, forsaken by friends, and then abandoned by his own father, left alone to die. Is that the conclusion of your ministry, Jesus? It didn't seem to turn out right. Oh, but child of God, it was right. It was the only route for redemption. Jesus knows what it means to be rejected. When you stand for him and you're rejected, you're in the best company you could be in. God went through all that rejecting because it was the only way he could adequately prove his love for you. Well, he's done more for you than you'll ever know. And what he wants is your love and your life in return. Would you be willing to give that to him this morning? To release your heart and your future into his hands. You've never accepted Christ as your savior, but you want to today. You want to be in his family. You want to be the recipient of his love forever. That could happen by means of a simple prayer that could change your life. You're saying, Pastor, I've never prayed that before, but I want to pray that prayer with you. Then all you have to do is just raise your hand good and high, and we will pray together today. If that's your desire, you could raise your hand right now. God bless you. Thank you, Father, for those who rededicate themselves to you on a regular basis. Thank you for the grace that you've given us to live a life that is pleasing to you. We don't know. When I took that church in June of 1980, I had no idea what was coming down the pike for Pastor Rick. In this room today, we don't know what the future holds, but boy, do we know who holds the future. The amazing thing is, Lord, in all the hassles I went through in various churches, I never missed a meal, I never missed a paycheck. You were always there to bless me, to care for me. And you will always be there for these wonderful people who've come here today to honor you. So give them the strength and the gumption and the guts and the fortitude to take the stands in the ways in which you've called them to stand. And let them experience the great glory that comes with that stand. It's my prayer for them. 
I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're so glad you came today. Great to be in the house of God. May God bless you as you're dismissed.